Uh, good morning, good afternoon. My name is George Casimos. Uh, um, uh, I was one of the first people to put it back together. I put it back together, and when I was almost done putting the cabinets up, they said uh, two things. <clears throat> one, your flood insurance is going from $1,000 to $30,000 a year. You're from, you went from an A zone to a B zone. And then shortly thereafter, they said, uh, you're required to raise your home. You are substantially in damage, right? Those two words together. Is my collar good? Do I look good? I mean, I know I don't. <laughs> uh, <laughs> not supposed to laugh, right? But anyway, um, so, so I wanted information because I like abiding by the law and the rules and the information kept on changing. I just got back into my home right after the holiday, right after Thanksgiving last year. So I was in my home and I was in my home after six months. It took almost a year to raise my home. So I was out of my home two times. And I think a lot of you guys are going to be out of your home two times. Is that correct? Yeah. So we have a bunch of experts here who are going to discuss a bunch of, bunch of issues, but I just want to run over a couple quick things. Um, when, when, you, when you find a contractor, you might have a brother-in-law that's a contractor, you might have a friend, a referral. If they do not understand building in a flood zone, if you're in the room, who's in the rent program? Raise your hand. If you're in the rent program and your contractor does not speak rent, if, just ask them this word. What do you know what an ECR is? If he doesn't know what an ECR is, estimated cost of repair, I don't care if he's the best builder in the world, he's not for you because you're going to get clawed back. Who's here for clawbacks? Anybody interested to have issues with getting clawed back from the rent program or scared of getting clawed back from the rent program? Okay. If if you didn't use a contractor that speaks REM, you're probably going to have issues. <clears throat> you want to make sure they're fiscally sound and and we've had a lot of fraud with these contractors. Um, in the REM program, who's in REM? And you're going through REM right now? You're going currently going through REM? Okay. Just the beginning. All right. There, there's two, there's one REM program, but it seems different for different people. Some people only get 150,000, other people get 150,000 plus cost for engineering up to 15,000. So some people get 150 and some people get 165. Mm -hmm. So depending on how it gets built and done and a contractor who understands that, you won't get caught back and you'll maximize up to $165,000. If you go to a house raiser, Okay, it might not be cost effective for you to raise your home. You might have to, it might be more cost effective and quicker to knock it down. But if you go to a house raiser, he's going to say, Oh no, it's cost effective to raise my house. If you go to a new home builder, he's going to say, Oh no, just, you, you know, you got you to knock it down. There's a fine line, okay, especially if you did not fix your home. Okay, so we have a new home builder and a home raiser. So you have both, okay? And they'll, they'll, they'll give you the, the skinny on that. Um, who's not in the rent program that's going to be raised? Okay. Not in the rent, but trying not to raise. Try, right. So you're trying to get information, but might be raised. So you need to... Right. Give you the one quick, quick piece of advice. Um, and you should join our group at Stop FEMA Now. And feel free, I gave, you, gave some of you my business card. Friend me, I'll put you in a group. We have pages and groups and all that stuff. Um, for instance, there's a young lady, her name is Lauren. She's from Brick. She's fantastic. She's been with our group forever. She was one of the first people that raised her home. And what she did is she said, I'm not waiting for these grant programs. I'm going to go get me an SBA loan. So she had a $300,000 first mortgage. She got another hundred thousand dollars back then. It didn't cost as much to raise because it was a different ball game. So she got a four hundred thousand dollar SBA loan, a wraparound mortgage, at like one point five percent. So at the end of the day, she's, her monthly payment is less now than it was before the storm. She had to raise house, and she's in and out real quick. So those are some of the creative ways. We also have uh, Jeff from Fairway Mortgage, who's going to give you some other creative, maybe two or three K options, and some other options here. Um, I thought I was smart. I went and did it myself. I do a lot of stuff, you know, myself. I went and try and, you know, do certain things. I went and got an architect. That was a mistake. Because if you're going to raise 
your home, Matt will tell you, you probably don't need an architect if you're just going to raise your home, and they'll explain that to you. So I spent all this money on, on an architect. I eventually needed an engineer, too, for some other. I, that's all a waste of money. Okay, so those are some of the things. If you think you're going to save money and time, it might be an issue here. Um, if you live close to the bay or close to the ocean, a block in or block out, the rules have changed again. Just last year, Alyssa talked a little bit about it. We have the coastal A zone now which is a different building requirement than the regular A zone, okay? So if you're stuck in that and your builder doesn't know that, it's gonna waste a lot of time. Come on, come on. Um, and there has been, and Alyssa will tell you, and maybe Matt also, that there's there's been builders that just came in and put a magnet. Please, I strongly, the reason we're having this meeting specifically is because one contractor, one, has defrauded 73 people that have come forward from one contractor. Now, whether he was, he was, that was his game plan in the beginning, to hit it and run, or whether it was, hey, let me just get jobs and I'll figure it, and he wasn't fiscally solvent. You know, he didn't know. He did two, house, he did two home, new home builds a year. Now he does 73 homes. That's $10 million. He doesn't know how to manage that kind of money. Okay? And that's what a lot of these guys, a lot of these guys were good guys that were bad business people. They're good builders. They can build a house or two, and you can do the numbers in your head. When you get 20 homes, that's three million dollars that you got to funnel around. And if the rent is keeping 20% of that, that's half a million. Please, when when you get a contractor, house subsidy contractor, go to his office. Go to his office. I know you want to get it done, and I know you want to go to his office. See what he's about. If he's got a magnet and a business card and crossed out phone numbers and stuff like that. Go in our group and say, hey, I'm thinking about using this guy. You know, there's a house lifter. He actually had a house that fell down. You might want that information, right? Would anybody want to use a, a house lifter that had a house fall down in the last year and a half? Absolutely not, right? We can give you that information. We'll just post it, okay? We kind of tell that. So we have in this one group, I'll call it the Ren Group, New Jersey Group. We have over 4,000. I think you're in it, right? Yeah. There were 4,000 people in that group. If you have a question on helicals or this or that, we have builders, we have engineers, we have all these folks in there that can answer it for you, so you have a quick question. So with that said, um, we're here to give you the information, all right? We're, we're gonna have everybody here, we're gonna have uh, Frank and Jerry, Alyssa, Jeff, and Matt. I am horrible at names and I got that all right. Um, they're all gonna sit here and give you some information. They are experts in their field, okay? Um, and I tell everybody, I like to keep things moving. We can sit here for four hours. We're not doing it, okay? If somebody goes along, I'm not rude. I'm just trying to keep it moving, okay? I want to get to the point and move on to the next one, okay? Um, so with that being said, Frank, you want to give us a, a few minutes and, and let, let us know about building and all that? Sure. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Frank Baldacchino. I'm with DNJ. We're a family owned company. My partner's background since 1989, probably about mm, 30 communities around the state in Pennsylvania, in Delaware. All right, so we've, we've built up and down the East Coast. We've built predominantly in Monmouth County, um, all new homes subdivisions. We've done some uh, 55 and over subdivisions, okay? Once the storm hit, the REM program was looking for replicable builders. So we went through the vetting process like a lot of other builders did in the state. Okay, so we went through the first round of vetting and we were chosen as one of the REM builders, one of the original REM builders. Now they're down to two. Basically it was us and DSW who now is starting to pull out also. Okay, so we've been in the program since the inception, which no one else can really say at this point. Um, we've done numerous new houses all the way from Ocean City, okay. New Jersey, all the way up to Union Beach. So all along the shore, we had to get gone through the demo process. Okay, the rebuilding process. I frame that was supposed to be happening. Okay, we know the REM program like the back of our hand. We have our own permitting guy. We have our own uh, submittals that does a submittal form. So it handles all the paperwork for everybody. Um, we have our own project managers that are in the field. They're at the houses every day. We have our own internal group that's in the office that supports the guys all in the field. So we basically are a 
from the ground to the finish. We take you every step away from the architectural to the engineering, to the actual construction, to the actual submittal, to the actual uh, getting the CO, okay? All in a timely manner, and you're in your house, you know, and usually like four to six, four to five months, depending, the REM gives you about 90 days to three months or so to get it done or four months to get it done. We rarely, ever missed our target point of getting people back we have a lot of information um, we have postcards in the back about our express build program okay which gets you back in your house in 100 days okay that's from building permit to finish okay so we also have a brochure in the back that has the models that we offer in the express build program so I want to make sure you take care of that uh, pick one of them up on the way out and also there's company information sheet on both Penn Jersey and DNJ all in the back there gives you our whole uh, timeline of when we started where we are today, how long we've been in the business, background on me and Jerry, and uh, all the various communities that we've done in the state. And also our website's a very useful tool. If you log on our website, you know, all your useful information is right on there for you. And uh, we're hands-on, so I mean, we're hands-on 24-7. If you have an issue, you have a problem, you have an email, you, see, you phone call us, you get a hold of us and we're, you know, we respond to you ASAP. So we handle everything from start to finish for you. And it's a pretty easy going process once we get it off the ground. Frank is quick and Jerry quick, short and sweet. Um, the one thing I, I, I like, they came and we discussed about doing uh, a sponsorship and we're very selective. Very, very versus it's the second contract, a $1.5 million bond. They're not going to walk away from your house list, okay? If you want insurance, that's what they're paying. That's what it is. Okay. Is it right? Am I correct in saying that? Yeah. We have like we're fully bonded, fully insured, fully licensed, home and ho new home and home improvements. So every every base has been covered. Um, we're also been a uh, quality builder homeowner. So you'll get a ten year homeowner's warranty. We've been the quality builder warranty program for probably close to twenty five years, and you, we've never had an issue whatsoever. Come, you can check our references on that. You can also check with the DCA. Okay, they've never had a one complaint about us lodged from a homeowner on a job that we've started and finished for them. So we also do a lot of custom building. I mean, that's what the majority of our homes were. Originally, we were doing custom building from 4,500 to 7,000 square feet up in the Monmouth County, Millstone, Manalpin, Colts Neck. That's where a majority of our work was done in the, in the previous 20 years. Then we've kind of branched out in different locations, and then we naturally got involved in the rim program. And then we were all all up and down the shore. Our home offices in Brick, New Jersey, right off of Manalok and Road. Our other offices are probably by the end of the month. So, um, if you have any questions, come see me after the after the meeting. I'll be more than happy to help you with uh, anything you might have. Any concerns? Any There's questions? an online question. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Sure. And are REM approved contractors and pathway being made aware of REM guidelines? Is there is there a contractor application form that outlines the REM guidelines that contractors are given? That's pathway B. So pathway B, everybody go right. Pathway C is when the state and you did the job, right? Yeah. And pathway yeah. B is I pick you. So you know how everybody goes, I'm REM approved. What does that really mean? <laughs> For pathway B, it just means that you have an HIC license. That means so it means nothing. Right. When everybody says I am REM approved pathway B, it means nothing. If you're REM approved pathway C, you are required to get a bond because if you screw the government, they want their money. You see what I'm saying? So please, when you say that, show me your bond, and they will show you their bond. Yeah, path, pathway C, the vetting process was was really involved in that. I mean, it was a. Uh, it was probably an undertaking with an attorney, engineers, architect, <clears throat> probably about a $15,000 endeavor on our part, just to lay out the money to present, just to lay out our presentation to the state to be chosen as one of the home rebuilding contractors in the state at that time and the, and the lift uh, contractors at that time. Um, a lot of the big builders couldn't even, Hobdanians, a lot of the big ones you see going up, they couldn't, they couldn't get vetted out. So it's like George has said, anybody can be a pathway B builder or subcontractor. Pathway C is a totally different ballgame. Okay. You got the backing of the state, you got the backing of, of a reputable builder that's been in, you know, that knows what they're doing, that's been involved in the building process for years and years and has a track record through quality product. You've built how many homes in the last 10 to 20 years? 
Ooh, probably no. close to 500 now. All right, 500 probably and close home. to 500. Thank you, Frank. Jerry, tell us about, about the house raising. Thank you very much, Frank, right? Is that not bad? Any questions? After, afterwards, stop by and see me. I'll be out here for you. Um, well, as far as uh, our two companies, Frank summarized it pretty good um, in, in saying that, you know, we definitely have a lot of experience and we've done big projects and handled many, you know, different types of projects also, not just homes or not just house something. So, uh, a lot of people, uh, when they came to us, we were able to kind of summarize with them, hey, you know, which is a better direction to go? Is it to lift the house? Is it to rebuild? So we would give them, you know, a fair uh, assessment of that because, <clears throat> like George said, I mean, yeah, if you're house lifting, you're going to, you know, naturally going to want the person to go ahead and lift even if the, uh, sorry about that. <laughs> Okay. That means people are asking you questions. Uh, so, uh, you know, so we're able to give a good assessment of, uh, you know, which way, which path to go in, and um, you know, we also recognize too that uh, the house lifting right from day one really wasn't about just being a GC because of all the regulations, paperwork, and changing uh, landscapes so fast. You had to be nimble. And our developing experience is what helped us do well in that. We were able to get through permitting problems, rent payment problems to the homeowners once Pathway C stopped. Originally, we were in Pathway C, and then when the state ended Pathway C, we just stayed down here and started to get a lot of Pathway B jobs. But essentially, you really needed to know the, uh, the ins and outs of how the customers, otherwise you really couldn't even do the jobs because at the time the people didn't even know how to get their second and third payments, things like that, and to follow their ECRs. So, so pretty Jeff, much did it take. So let me just ask you a couple questions. You, how many homes have you raised? Uh, we did about 100 like from start to finish. Okay, period. so 100. So that means like 20 to 30% of your final payment, that's $3 million is out in the street. So this, what I'm saying is this gentleman and his company has the force to hold a $3 million holdback. So think about it. When you're talking to the guy sitting across the table that's going to build your house and not get you stuck, a lot of these homes are stuck because you got clawed back and the contractor didn't have that $2 million or 20 or 30%, whatever that number is at the end, to get you over the hump. is going to say, do not give your full $150,000, whatever that number is, to raise your house. How much, how much money do you ask down when you sign a contract? Well, see, we were, yeah, we were much different than most guys. We would only um, take a 5% deposit, and then no other payments were due. We landed on site, mobilized to do the home elevation itself. So, you know, we never really got a lot of the money up front and, you know, pretty much carried the jobs through. Uh, we got paid when we got paid. Mm -hmm. Pathway C was uh, more difficult in that regard than B because basically we were one-on-one -on -one with the customers and we could structure our payment schedule and our contract to how their exhibit ones read. So we knew how, you know, when they were, when and how much of the distributions they were going to get. So it worked out well and people were able to get in and they'd have a small balance due uh, by the time they moved in, but it wasn't, wasn't terrible. But we could keep it moving. We didn't have to stop it if they didn't get the rent payment. Sometimes a person would, you know, submit for it but not get it for two or three months. And then the contractor would say, well, I can't do any more work. And then the job would sit. We would just move through them and finish them. And we were keeping track of all the uh, submittals. And how, and soon, how soon after you, rate, you, you got a CO? Did you get REM to take the lien or encumbrance? Or right now, I, I mean, of all the clients that we've done, I don't, I don't think anybody got a clawback. That so I no, no clawbacks. Okay. Not, not that I know. Because they would owe you the money, right? Well, they would owe me the money. Yeah, in a sense, nobody got a clawback. And then uh, the other thing is to um, the lien removal which is when that person is completely done with REM. Yeah. I am kind of out of the picture at that point because, right. you know, I've so got to see. Uh, That's fine. Well, no, I mean, some people have got it done, but that process is time consuming. I think it probably would take an average person probably 
after they got their CO and after I was paid even, it probably would still take them six months to a year of paperwork with the state to get the lien on. And that's really between the state and the homeowner. And so if, if people wanted to come and meet you two guys, uh, obviously they can call uh, DENJ or Penn Jersey, yeah, yeah. but it's real easy because you're right in the mix of things. You're the first property, when I come off of 35 on Manilokan Road, right, yeah. you're the first property going on Manilokan Road on the left. Is that correct? Yes, yes. Is that correct? It's yes. got a big yellow sign there? Yeah. All right, so if anybody, we'll give you the phone number, the email. Look, I'm not saying use them. I'm saying definitely talk to them and, and, and find out what somebody real Somebody substantial knows what they're talking about, and then put then put them up against the next guy. Okay, um, the next the next person I want is uh, Miss Cummings. I we we've had her. Uh, she's the township engineer from Brick. She is a wealth of knowledge. You if you live in Brick, you should know her on a first name basis, but you might not have to because she's going to give you all the answers today. Is that good? <laughs> she's great. So listen, you tell us first, and then we'll hit you with some questions. Uh, um, my name's Alyssa. Please call me Alyssa. Um, I am the engineer and the floodplain manager for Brick Township. So if you live in Brick, I, I am the responsible person in charge of making sure that we stay in compliance with the National Flood Insurance Program and the local building codes. Um, if you don't live in Brick, I can give you advice, but I highly recommend you to check with the floodplain manager in your town for their interpretation of things. Um, and I've been here since the onset. I, I pretty much lived in Town Hall with Hurricane Sandy hit, and I've I'd make myself available as possible throughout the duration for anything that we need. Um, I, I work directly for the town now. Um, and so how many how many homes are substantially damaged and not in compliance right now? So we got a letter from the state indicating that they're not extending the deadline, the current deadline to come into compliance, yep. or at least pull your permit to come into compliance is October of 2018. Uh, and what happens after that? I already know that. Assuming we don't get another extension, yep. um, I think there's two avenues, there's two things happening. The expense program yep. may suspend your ability to get subsidized flood insurance. And mortgages. Well, your mortgage lender is still going to require you to carry flood insurance, but if you can't get an NFIP subsidized policy, you're going to have to get it in the free market and pay the actuarial rate. And I gotta tell you, if you're paying a thousand dollars in the NFIP, chances are it's gonna cost you six thousand from Lloyd's of London. Or more. Could be. I, yep, I'm not gonna yep. pretend to be an insurance expert. <laughs> yep. I know enough to be dangerous, I know guidelines, you'll find I use very general numbers because I, I know the rules, but I I don't other than it going up and down, I don't know how it I actually, I'm sorry, listen, I actually have what your actuary rate is going to be. We have a flyer out there. We have a pamphlet. If you have a question, I'll explain it to you. I'm a realtor and I'm a broker. And when a buyer comes to me and says, I want to buy this house, it's only $1,000 a year. Then I explain to them, it's 1000 today, but this is what your actuary rate is going to be in three or five or 10 years. And it's simple. We can give you that information and I have it back there. We can give that for you. It's very important. Also, what FEMA does do is uh, it, number one, it squeezes the town. The brick is getting a 10% discount. Center the program, we're gonna get a 20% discount. So number one is, who lives in brick? You wanna thank the mayor, the council, and the engineer, because you're getting, you're paying 20% less than us, okay? Because you're getting, a, they're doing something, and you're getting a 20% discount. That being said, if all those homes are not raised, see, when people are gonna start getting raised, and find or whatever that's going to be, everybody's going to be mad at Alyssa and the township. It's not them. It's the state and FEMA that's pushing it down their necks. Okay, I'll back you up on that, Alyssa. And I, agree. I am the, usually the bearer of bad news. Like, honestly, if you're talking to me, something's wrong. And it's very similar to contracts. Like I have to say, I've seen the faces, but I really don't know these gentlemen, and that's a good thing. Typically, if I know your contractor, it's not good. I, I, I'm just going to tell you that flat out. Like I, the contractor knows the construction official. If I have to be on the job, usually it means something is wrong. <laughs> um, and, but to answer your original question, we had um, we had about 1,500 to 2,000 substantially damaged homes. I sent out 571 letters earlier this month for structures that were in compliance. So about in compliance. Right. We've had a few hundred to a thousand that voluntarily weren't substantially damaged but came into compliance anyway. Right. Um, and 571 that were deemed 
SD and have the full permits or something. So, so there's 571 people that are denying it or don't know that there's substantial damage. Is that correct? We've not gotten any letters back so far of change of ownership. Okay, so so what you, so what I'm gonna, I'm gonna explain this as a realtor. Some realtor, 90 realtors and 90 homeowners sold their house knowingly or unknowingly that it was substantially damaged. This is one town. I'm telling you, there are thousands of homes in New York and New Jersey right now being sold that are substantially damaged. Buyer beware. So if you sell your home, I, I will tell you as a realtor, they will come out of your house, you go buy another house, and they're going to come after you. Okay, you and your realtor. So please, you must you must fully disclose that information. And as a buyer, you better fully understand that because you're going to be uh, you're going to have issues. So uh, I have I have a question. I know it's going to come up here. Is um, if I'm if I'm if I don't if I have a ranch and I have about two or three feet of water, or right? if I have a ranch and I have eight feet of water, I'm substantially damaged. Is that correct? Chances are, if you have a ranch and you had more than an inch of water in your house, you're substantially damaged. Okay. Can I tell you? I'm just going to give you a side note. I was I was in Louisiana three separate times. You know what they say in, in the township? You go, and these are the towns where the whole town got destroyed. 30, 20, 30 thousand people. You go to the town, and everybody's got seven feet of water, and it's a ranch. They say, "Do you want to be substantially damaged?" Is the question. That, that, the girl behind the counter says, "Do you want to be substantially damaged?" But here's the problem. They're going to come order you. Is that correct? To be fair, I did that for people. Right. When, when the RREM program came out, there were plenty of people that wanted to be substantially damaged. Yeah, they yeah. They wanted to qualify for that program. They didn't know they were going to open it up to anyone right. who signed up. And I wanted to get you on the side of substantial damage that you wanted yeah, to be yeah. on. If you want to not be substantially damaged. But I needed documentation with you to do it. Right. And I had to make this damage was accounted for in the cost of replacement. Right. But I tried to help everybody that I could. Of course, look, no, we're, we're all human, and I know, and I've heard very good things about it. What I'm saying is, if you're in that threshold, you know, you don't have nine feet of water in your house, and you don't have any, you're in that threshold. If I bring estimates, and I bring appraisals and stuff like that. Can I massage and kind of get on or off the list if I choose, if I can? And, yeah, absolutely. In an isolated event, I could evaluate 10 houses or a block that flooded. In this instance, like Sandy, there were thousands of homes. Yeah. We did an own estimate based on the square footage of your home and the depth of water that we assumed you had. Right, right. We did a door to door inspection. I keep a database. So if you are going to sell your house, please call the town or buy a house, call the town and find out what damage record we have for it. Um, but and, and there was there were swings. There were you know, there were houses in town that put new flower boxes on them. They would have been substantially. <laughs> right. So and can you explain the difference between a substantially damaged home and a home that falls into the substantial improvement, and then you have to raise it? Correct. So they're similar. Substantially damaged means the cost of repair is percent of the fair market value of the structure. Substantial improvement means the result of the improvement will be in excess of a 50% increase to the fair market value of your structure. Um, so if you're putting on an addition and you're doubling the size of your house, chances are you're a substantial improvement. Okay, so, so let's say my home is worth $100,000. I got $40,000 in damage, and I want to... I wanna, uh, I want to put a twenty thousand dollar addition on the second floor. So now forty damage and twenty anew. It's it, this, and this is where the NFIP really doesn't make my life easier because it's very arbitrary. And that twenty thousand dollars isn't the cost of construction. It's one of the factors I look at, but it's the actual definition is will it result in an increase to the fair market value? So there's people putting. I'm sure, I had a guy put two hundred thousand dollars into his home. He made his house ADA compliant for his lawyer. Didn't increase the fair market value of it one bit. Okay. So I mean, it's, it's but it's something to consider. If if, if, you, if you know, if you put an addition on it, so so correct me if I'm wrong. If I take an 800 square foot bungalow in Ortley, in, in, in one of these brick beaches, and knock it down and put a 3,000 square foot home, it has to be elevated at that point. Okay. Correct. New construction and substantial construction, whether improvement or okay. damage, has to be built in accordance with the NFI. Okay, we're going to get questions out there. I just want to hit them because I'm getting them on here. Uh, Jeff from Fairway Mortgage. 
Yes, I'm just not, I'm here to tell you, I was started here day one. I've lived here uh, since Sandy. I've worked with a lot of different people, I'm sure. Everybody's having, the reason I, when we first started talking about this, I was saying we're kind of entering a new phase now, as everybody knows. A lot of rent money is starting to dry up, a lot of special funds. A lot of people, I, I feel, here are going to be doing this on their own, spending their own money out of their own pocket, trying to raise your home and get it into compliance. Um, one of the things that we do is, I don't know how many you looked into other kinds of finding loans or rehabilitation loans, there's a home style loan, different loans that will raise your house. Again, it's a real simple way to look at it. If your home is worth $300,000, and you want to raise it, fix it, and complete it up, it'll be worth $500,000. We base a loan on the $500,000 final price. So all those things can be done to your home in one loan, finished, and you're done. That's a nice way to do it. We also do bulkheads and things, so I know it's kind of a new thing we added, that um, I've had a lot of realtors come to me that I think, I don't know how many people have bulkheads here. It's a very important part of the home. It, everybody kind of ignores it, but we all know it costs twenty, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000, whatever it is. So it's really can, you know, can you finance that? When I buy it, am I getting a two or three K loan? That would be a home style loan if you did the bulkhead, which is a little more flexible. It, it, again, just so you know what a home style loan is, it's a renovation loan that as long as you add something of value and it's permanent, you can add to the loan. Like you can fix a pool, believe it or not. You can do a window loan. It, it's basically, again, I'm saying it's an after appraised value. We can look at the house today, $300,000, whatever it's worth. The house raises, again, I don't want to put a number on, we're all different, and some of the work you do is, you know, is afterwards. So we'll appraise it and it's finished out of it. So you can get a loan based on that and do all the work at once. You can also roll it into one of the REM loans, because I'm sure a lot of people here, you know, once you raise your home, you're looking at putting another deck on, you kind of lose all your air, you want to change it up a little bit, you might want to add a room to it. We can add on top of that REM loan to that loan, so you want to do that. One critical thing everybody has to remember here is, uh, Try and think of your financing before you do this job because you don't want to get stuck. And I've, I've actually worked with Jerry, great to work with, where we had a situation where COs are in question. Um, you want to make sure that most people have a CO now that they I don't know if it's Make sure your financing's in place first. What you're going to do, how you're going to pay for it before you do any other work. No, no matter who you go with, you want to make sure it's in place first. And, um, you know, like I said, there's everybody here you can refinance. Some of you have second home. You can refinance your northern home and then use the money for that. You can do, some people might want to reverse mortgage. We, we can also do that in some homes. And, uh, you know, there's a whole lot of different options. You got everybody's story is a little different. So, um, the other thing that George kind of put in there, which is very interesting about value for the mortgage people, I will give a mortgage to anybody, but you have to have a fund. So um, if you, again, the $6,000 number is an ideal number to work with, because I've said to people, if you have a $6,000 a $6, uh, flood insurance policy, that basically has increased the value of your home when you sell it by almost $100,000, because that person, if you're below elevation, has to pay that. That $500 a month, it costs them in borrowing power for that person if they're going to get a mortgage. You know, you're going to limit yourself to the market and it's going to be a cash sale. Uh, people will still buy them. I know that. I see it every day. But understand that the mortgage, whatever you pay in flood insurance, is going to go to the bottom line of that person's ability to borrow that you sell your house to. Um, so, any, you know, I would say the main thing is think about your financing ahead of time if you're going to finance, have it in place, and then go ahead with your raising or lifting or anything like that. So I have a question. What if what if I'm stuck in the air or I'm going to finance and let's say like uh, my house raise was over two hundred thousand, okay? And Ron gives me one hundred fifty. Where do I come with the fifty? Can you finance me with a well, you know I have a REM grant in place? Can you finance him and give me over the top of that last fifty or yes. thirty? You can. Yes. So before I even start, yeah, you would want to get me. It, you want to get it ahead of time. To tell us correct. Uh, well, okay. So the, the the reason I have people here. Is because they're doing something really good and he's one of the first mortgage people that can finance across REM because REM puts a lien on your property right so that's your thing it's hard to get a lien as a real child I'll tell you you got a lien on your property and mortgage guys gonna say no this guy's saying yeah. a whole lot of people, some people are stuck in the middle yeah Deal with that. And, and, whole lot of and, and also, just so people people know, you know, my, my house is only worth X amount right now. It's damaged. It's not really worth anything. Jeff's program is going to is takes into account what your home is going to be worth at the end. 
Okay, after it's raised, if you put a couple garages underneath and do all that good stuff, what is it worth then? And then he works backwards. So it's just something there, there to see. Thank you very much, no, Jeff. No, give the ability to do the things you want to do. I appreciate it, Jeff. Thank you very much. And we got Matt. Matt. Matt's an engineer. Um, I never met Matt, but a lot of people in our group really like Matt. I don't know if, if it's because he's cute or because he's bright, but uh, <laughs> but he, he knows his stuff. And I have one question for you. And I, I had the I had the engineer. I mean, I wish I had this. Four years ago, so I could you know learn. But do I need an architect to raise just raise a home, just up and stairs? The, the answer to that's no. So architects and engineers are um, in New Jersey also called the type of architect can do, and an architect can do things that an engineer can do. In all honesty, an architect can take your project from start to finish. Um, but I guess. Probably what George ran into is sometimes architects are used to working in in a world where um, it's an it's a craft it's an art um, and it, and typically the fees are a little bit more expensive for, from the architectural side and a lot of times you'll get um, you'll get design information that you may not necessarily need it may be you know overboard for what um, for what the project really really entails so um, a lot of people for just a straight lift would hire an engineer directly and could avoid um, could avoid an architect but that doesn't mean that if uh, if you have a friend or, or someone who's, who is an architect and who's done a lot of these, doesn't mean they can't do just as good of a job as an engineer. Um, I, I guess some architects just do design. They don't they don't get into uh, foundation or anything structural. So I'll get, um, had a call the other day from a homeowner. She spent a lot of money on plans. And on the plans it said, uh, use, use existing foundation, verify and feel. Um, what that means is that if it if it got approved by the town that way, what's going to happen is during construction, someone's going to uh, get to the site and start digging around, and they're going to have to look at it. she needs local piles, maybe uh, she needs something else, and that can be really expensive, you know, to the tune of thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars just because um, the architect didn't handle that in his scope of work. So, um, so a lot of times, I'll even work directly for architects who um, who just aren't comfortable with that part of it and hire me to tell them whether, whether or not the foundation is any good. So, um, what about, tell me about helicals, um, different depths. What, just tell me the 30 second thing on helicals. <laughs> well, I guess just kind of to back it up, not, I, I can talk for, forever on this. Yeah, I know. Um, so, um, so I've been involved in over 2,000 uh, house lifts or new construction since Sandy um, in New York and New Jersey, including my own parents. Um, and I, I would say normally, the first call you, you should make is to uh, the engineer or a builder and find out what engineer he's going to be working with. Um, we should be on site kind of right away to figure out. Um, we we want to look at your existing elevation so we can see how high you have to go. Okay on your site. Um, do we need to, can we use your existing foundation? Can we demo it and put in a spread footing, which is just a, a beefed up version of what you might already have? Or are we going to need to put in helical piles, um, which get driven down 20, 30 feet past where, where we, if we found bad soil, they get driven past that? Um, all of a variety of costs associated with each of those modifications to your foundation. So, I, I, I'm, I'm going to interrupt you here. Um, I, I had to use helicals, I had an existing home, and I had to use helicals. And I actually sold a lot two doors down for me. Uh, it was uh, a home that was substantially damaged, got knocked down. And the gentleman's doing a great job. He's building a two-story home on block, no helicals. So is it is it really? My question is, it's just the same story. That call, Alyssa and 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 Matt. It, it is. I can answer that. I see. I get, to be honest with you, I get paid sometimes just to take someone else's design that costs just the, it's just overkill. Um, the rebar spacing is every single cell, the rebars are this big, um, and I'll get paid just to value engineer it, which means I take it and, you know, from a design standpoint, it's a little more lean, and it's going to work, but it's going to cost a lot less. So so a lot of engineers and, and architects, um, they we call it design scare. It's what they feel safe doing. Yeah, they, they design okay. scare. Alyssa, just tell me, I'm sorry, I'm not. What do you think about the helicals? I mean, is it is it do you whatever the engineer says you kind of stamp or I mean you know? I thought well, if it meets the code and it's certified, more or less, yeah, we have to approve it. Okay. I'll tell you. I'm going to quote the construction official. Uh, yeah. You can build a house that meets 
every code in the book, and I wouldn't want to live in it. The code is the minimum you're allowed to do. Okay. There's also definitely engineers, design professionals, and architects that like to over design. I, we've seen it. Wow. And I, I, $10,000 in lumber by value engineering. The one I didn't even need. 42 helicals. I needed 42 helicals. That's what I needed. My guy next door, two doors down, spread footed. You know what? You know what each helical cost? The cost for the helical, the connector on top, the bond, the bond beam, and the pier and the superstructure is about 2500 bucks each. 40 helicos is about $100,000 extra cost on my project. So get a good engineer. You might want to talk to that guy right there. Right? That, now, you work with, with these guys? Right, I work with Jerry. Jerry, um, so, well, let me, let me just back up. I think it's important for people um, to know. One of, the, one of the things that I think was the, the biggest mistake um, that people made at the height of lifting houses with contractors was they would go to the contractor, and the contractor would give them a quote for, 125, 150, 180, whatever it was, thousand dollars, sixty thousand dollars in some cases, and the homeowner would say, "Okay, I got all these prices. Yours is the best, or I like you the best." And they sign on the dotted line. Then the builder calls the engineer um, to come out and start working at their foundation and some of the things that we're talking about. So um, from there, the prices. Okay. So now you have the sixty thousand dollar contract, and and the builder wrote to be determined in the foundation. We don't sign a contract unless the builder has had an engineer look at it or is fitting a set of plans that you hired the engineer directly to. Right. When you raise a house and the sill is no good, most of the time the sill is no good, it's an extra. you got to pay for it. You know what I mean? Um, if you need helicals and it wasn't in your design, it's an extra. You're going to pay for that. Do you have the extra $100,000 for that? You have, and I'm not trying to get you there, but that's what happened to me. I knew I had soft soil. I knew I had an issue because I had put, the, put an addition on my house before. And he said, you couldn't go through stories. This is years ago. So I knew I had some kind of issue. So um, here, here's, thank you very much, Matt. Now, were these guys so far informative on just their three minute speech? Is that good? Give them a round of applause, please. I appreciate that. I'm gonna go, uh, I'm just gonna answer a few questions online. And uh, so what is the mandatory con contractor addendum? I don't even, does anybody know the answer to that? Yeah, it's a, it's a form that uh, when you do a contract with a customer in Pathway B, um, that homeowner gives the contractor the form in which it has about, I think, 22 questions on it. And me, if it's a house lift, for instance, for Penn Jersey, I would, I'm the contractor. I have to go and initial and answer each question and give it back to them. Okay. So it's a it's a okay. easy put, but it's a uh, uh, submittal. It needs to be. It's not they, they they may use it at four closeout, but it's done uh, before they actually do any work. Okay. So it's done at contract. Gotcha. All right, and then uh, what is turnkey? What is a turnkey contract? That just means uh, the person uh, <coughs> when they hire me or another contractor to do the job, you take it from the start and put them back in with a CO. So there's no real loose ends or anything. Sometimes, you know, uh, somebody might hire you to just pick the house up and put a foundation in, and uh, they would do the stairs, electric, plumbing. Okay. So. Um, I hate FEMA and this and that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's always good. Uh, are there incentives? Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, where is this happening? Okay, I'll answer that uh, in a minute. Uh, okay, houses were raised and reset not in compliance with your town's flood elevation requirements. Were they not raised high enough or too high? I had one that wasn't raised high enough. I've heard, I've had several, of them, uh, I've had several members where, correct me if I'm wrong, anybody jump in, uh, they, they put it on the block, they, they build the foundation, and then they have to get, they have to shoot it, and you've got to sign off on it, right? 
Bricktown's a little unique in that as a floodplain manager, I'm not the construction official. Usually it's the construction official or the zoning officer or somebody that's see when, when you're building a house or when you're listing a house, you have to get what's called a uh, foundation. foundation location survey which makes sure that the zoning officer looks at it to make sure it's in compliance with the setbacks and where you said it was going to be on your property. And the building subcode official looks at it to make sure your, your block is at the right elevation. And they were doing that. I wasn't looking at it because I never even knew this thing existed until I had a house come back that was, I, it was like two inches too low. And it met, it, to be fair, it met the NFIP requirement. It didn't meet the one foot of free board. Oh. Um, but I still couldn't sign off on it. So now I check the uh, foundation location surveys, or, or the central right. official bring them to my attention if something and, and they got to get signed off. But some guys are dropping them. I've heard some contractors, they drop them, then you get nothing. <clears throat> have you had that? Have you had guys go, I mean, yeah. not going by the book. Okay. There's a, what, what um, she may never see it, but there are houses that have been lifted that when the foundation locations are shot, they're, they're too low. And then the, the Hopefully, they didn't put the house down and then they had block to it. There has been cases I've heard of where houses have been put back down, the foundation location shot, they didn't do it in the right sequence, and then they had to pick the house back up. It has happened. It doesn't happen very often. Right. Uh, if you live in brick, how do you know if you're getting a 20% discount on your flood insurance and is that for completed homes? If on your renewal, it should show you uh, at the bottom line. It'll say what your price is. It'll say CRS, Community Rating System Discount. It'll say a six, which equals a 20% discount. So you should have everything summed up, and it'll be at the bottom. Um, you won't see it until you get your renewal. We just got in in May this month, so if you're going forward, you should see it. Um, and I'm told that you should get a percentage back when you renew. Like if your renew is in September, you should get the three-month discount from this year, okay. from 2017. Okay, now do you guys work with uh, Gilvane and CBI to get to the CO? Like, like how does that work? Um, well, we did work more hand in hand with them at Pathway C. Um, so we do know a lot of people down there and have a pretty good relationship with them which is a release from the homeowner to let us talk to the their project managers down there, then we don't talk to them. Okay. But some, well, most, do most, people, yeah, most people do have us sign that so we can talk to them for. Uh, Close out, run. Okay. Yep. Yep, I like that. Okay, and then we're almost done with the questions, and then we'll get everybody. Are peer footings supposed to be inspected before or after houses were set? Okay, uh, that depends on the town. Um, oh, pier footings? Oh, that would be before, yeah. It, you okay with you know, It can actually be a mix. So, um, this is from, from the engineering standpoint of the house. So, your, your existing house is um, on a foundation that may have settled. Um, you probably had a builder come in and level your floors out um, after the storm. So, say your floor joists had settled and they were like this, and the builder came in and made them level. Um, the floor just may need to be out of level, keep your floor level inside the house. So what, what we'll do sometimes is um, on these older homes that, are, that we know may have some issues, they'll lower the, out, the house down on the perimeter foundation and the interior piers, they'll just leave the, everything kind of temporarily posted inside the house. And then they'll, they'll kind of move that beam around until your floors are completely level and then they'll build the piers up. So not always are the pier footings inspected before the house is down. Sometimes Cribbing's in the way, right. sometimes there's, uh, there's issues. I wrote, I wrote, okay. Um, are there any grants? Anybody know of any grant? The only thing we heard of uh, a reimbursement grant a few towns applied for, I think, Brigantine, Margate, yeah. Ventnor, I think. That was actually, in, I tried to get it for Brick, but it was because of uh, Jonas. Oh. Hurricane Jonas. And they got what well, we got during Sandy, Cape May, and Atlantic counties got during Jonas. So it was only eligible for that event. Okay. okay. You can open it up if, if people want to start asking questions. Go, go right ahead. 
I'm with Kate May, you said Kate May. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit on, on that? So the mayor found uh, somebody had sent him an article about a new grant program that was coming to help people lift their houses. And you know, he said, if we want in, or at least look into it. Right. Uh, and I called the floodplain manager in Seattle City, who's a great guy, Neil. And um, I said, what is this? And he goes, oh, it's, it was for, I think, Jonas. It was Jonas or Matthew, I forgot. Jonas, the Jaguar problem. Yes. And it was, you know, you had a, a 500 year event. And just similar, we had the REM program for our program that, and Jonas for us here wasn't that bad. And we had some minor flooding, but like nothing like Irene or Sandy. And it was the official from Seattle City, is that? I believe it, uh, it was Neil. Neil is uh, he's the floodplain manager, okay. and I'm not sure if he's a zoning officer. Okay, thank you. What towns have you guys done work in, uh, Jerry and Frank? Can like uh, pretty much. Um, um, from Union Beach down to Ventnor, so Manahawkin, even yes, Manahawkin, you have Beach, Margate, uh, yeah. Ocean yeah. City, yeah. Margate, yeah, yeah. Ocean yeah. City, Ventnor down that way, yeah. Okay, all the way pretty much from Ocean City up to Union Beach. Okay, all the way up, you know, and, and, you and all the towns kind of in between. And you service those areas. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Atlantic City. Next question. Tom River. First. How has the New York City lawsuit? And the revisions of the flood maps affected the elevations in work? So far, not at all. Okay. Um, New York City appealed the preliminary flood maps and they won. And as a result, there was an independent board assigned to come up with a solution or a resolution to the issue, and they decided that the FIP has to be the map. In doing that, I mean, they used two storms, one from 1990 and one from 1960. They do our now they have to incorporate a lot more data. The county by decrease us by about a foot in elevation, rough numbers. Um, and it started out as two to three feet in New York City, and it went down to like zero to plus one as you got to Cape May County. The further away you got from Long Island to Cape May, the less it helped you. I, I want to get on this. I, uh, I I spoke with the resiliency office in in New York. It's a groundbreaking study. Um, generally, what do you, what do you usually do when you fight the maps? You go and make sure that they they see the dunes and they see coves and stuff like that, right? I, I would send them topography. I would send them like elevations of your your properties. They they people in the Beasel that were on a coastal bluff. Just I, just things that generally didn't make sense to me. But you, I would just look at the map. And I can identify what didn't make sense to me, but until you actually had the exact science that they used to put the map together, which they don't give you, it's almost impossible to go through it like you would go through a stormwater report or a hydrographic analysis and say, oh, no, no, there's your error. It's have you, by the way, have you seen the, um, the report from your city? Yeah. Well, gonna, I'll, I'll, get your, I'll get you the whole copy if you want. It's great. So I spoke to them. I was actually on a conference call with a bunch of folks in New York City, the council, and the board. Uh, about the board is they're between one and two feet too high. So because we're in the same region as New York City, they have to redo all the maps. So it's going to take us a few more years before we get our final maps. There's okay. something else we should yeah. consider. Please. It's going to have way more than those two storms in it. It's going to have Sandy. It's going to have Irene. It's going to have Matthew. It's going to have Nemo. And it's going to have Jonas. It could go up. It could go up. <laughs> I'm just, I, I'm, I'm not afraid yet because, I mean, the elevations of the map were higher than Sandy, and that's the worst we've seen. But there is the potential for the elevations to go up. Right. Um, so, number one, we're not going to get our final maps for many years. From Katrina, they didn't get their final maps till last year. It was like 12 years. Final maps, firm maps from Katrina till, till then. I just want to give you, uh, somebody was talking about what your actual, so some people are thinking, do I have to raise? Do I do I want to knock it down? Am I going to be able to sell it? What's, what's the flood insurance going to be? Because the subsidies are getting pulled, right? We know that, right? There will be, in, in, in five or 10 years, there will probably be no more subsidies, right? The flood insurance program is $24 billion in debt going on. Okay. 
So I'm just going to. Yep. Go ahead. I mean, we're subsidized if you're paying NFIP insurance regardless. Right. So if you're not paying six grand Lloyd's money. Right. But you're going. So everybody's going to get. Here's where we are today with today's legislation. If you have not been substantially damaged, if you are not a second homeowner, you're going to get up to an 18% compounded yearly increase until you reach your actuary rate. If you're a second homeowner, if you've been substantially damaged and you didn't raise, if you're a commercial property owner, you will receive a 25% compounded yearly increase and a $250 surcharge until you reach your actuary rate. This is what I'm getting at. So today we are subsidized, and we're going to be subsidized until you reach your actuary rate or they change the legislation. By the way, we've been going down to D.C. for the last year and change from folks stopping and out folks from across the country going to try and slow the increases, okay, and keep our premiums down. So here's what your actuary rate will be, and this is a, if you're at BFE, your your actuary rate, it will never go higher than today's rate, up to $819, okay, if you're built at the BFE, it's $819. If you're one foot below the BFE, your actuary rate jumps to $5,623, one foot below the BFE. So imagine those new maps that are wrong by two feet, in some cases in New Jersey, that's a big number. And it goes from $5,000 to $25,000 as you go down more. Okay, that's in an A zone. If you're in a B zone, and I don't have the B zone in front of me, if you're at BFE, it's like $4,000, $5,000 at BFE, your actuary rate. So everybody needs to kind of fully understand that. Um, uh, Jerry and Frank made color copies for you guys. Feel free to take one. And this is the page you want to know. Your this bottom one. This is your actuary rate. What you're actually going to be paying uh, when your premiums go up. I'm sorry about that. Um, next question. Yes, sir. Um, I'll talk, uh, anybody want to jump on that? So, ice, ice. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. It stands for increased cost of compliance, that ICC. Okay, um, it's thirty thousand dollars that flood insurance makes available to you if you are substantially damaged, and you have thirty. You get the maximum from FEMA, so fifty thousand dollars in damage. You don't qualify for ICC. Um, it depending on your insurance carrier. You may be able to get some of that money up front, like if you have a contract with someone to elevate your home, um, you may get another installment once your house is at the right elevation. For some insurance carriers, they won't give you anything until you have your CO. Now, let me ask you this. You're going to get a sum from rent, 150 or the engineering, 165. Is 30,000, is that top of that? Nope. So, so that is, who does not know what duplication of benefits means? Okay, duplication, if you're in REM, you, you, are you in our group, are you, are you on Facebook? Yeah. You should come join our group, are you in our group? No, well, I'm on your email list. Okay, yeah, you should join our group because we have a little bit more information, but duplication of benefits is very important. So if you have a duplication of benefits, it becomes a clawback at the end. Getting ICC in most cases is a duplication of benefits unless you have a high unmet need. And these guys will tell you. Now, most people say if you get ICC, it's a duplication of benefits. That's incorrect. If you have a high unmet need, then you can still get it or a portion of it. Okay? Yeah. And working with somebody who knows, and by the way, Another reason I like these guys, and I do like these guys, is they have the, the preeminent expert. Unless you're talking to the head of the REM program, you want to talk to the young lady that works for her. She worked for REM. She's a professor. She worked in New York. Uh, with the D I mean, the, the girl so overqualified. She worked for Ocean County Long-Term Recovery Group. Uh, she, this girl knows REM. Um, you know, uh, Sherry. Sherry. Yeah. So what he does, because I asked him the, the, the process is, he takes your rent grant and he sits down and he says, all right, this is where you're going to be. You're going to be short this much, barring you know, some little issues. He's going to do his engineering. He's going to do this. And then he's going to have Sherry or him or whatever look through it and say, this is where you're going to be. 
Instead of signing a contract, a, a contract, you go, all right, you've got 150000 here, let's do this. And if they don't comply, you're going to get caught back. And on top of it, you know that that is a minefield that you better know that person. Right. What, what are the tax ramifications of raising your house? from an assessed value. If I have a house and I have an assessed value, I go, I raise the house, it costs me fifty, sixty, eighty thousand dollars It's the same house, same square footage. Straight lift? None. None at all. Because you still have a three bedroom, one and a half bath house? None. If you put in a double garage downstairs, you might see a bump. If you do an addition in line with it, you'll get assessed on the increased value. But if you're just doing a straight lift, um, and actually a lift, with the garage space, you don't pay any affordable housing fees, and you, you may get a tax bump for having not having an attached garage. But a lift, straight lift, is no affordable housing fee, no tax. Bump. And you may want to talk to the tax assessor because she can give you the hardcore number on it. I, I, but I don't think you get anything. So my assessed value before should be the same assessed value after. Correct. As a realtor, I will tell you. Put the garage. If you're gonna raise, if you're gonna raise it four feet, raise it another four. Pay the extra taxes because the garage space is gonna is gonna really, you know, I, we don't want to pay taxes, but the value is gonna offset that. First, so if you're gonna, a lot of people are tired and want to get. Definitely put the garage down. Okay, so uh, my father had, was, uh, you know, affected by Sandy. And at the time, you know, there was craziness going on, and we were told at the time we just get back into the house any way you can. So, make a long story short, we were, you know, we had some flood insurance money we were provided. Um, we had some help from Habitat Cue from it, from Habitat for Humanity. He got back into his house. He's been living in it for the past X number of years, um, and he was just provided with one of those letters that he was substantially damaged. So he owns his home. What should we be doing today to, you know, what are his options? Does he need to still lift? He's 84. He's okay. And you're in brick. And we're in brick. Okay. So, sure, acres. so you have the ability to try and appeal the determination and we can work your numbers and see if we can get you on the side of substantial damage before you pay. I mean, if it's, if it was close to 90 to 100% damaged, it's a long shot, but we can try. Um, you, I'm assuming you don't want to lift. Um, I, we are told that after the deadline, we're not going to be able to issue permits for substantially damaged homes unless that permit is in conjunction with coming into compliance. So, I would suggest anything that you want to do to the house that you're going to need a permit for, you try to get done before then. Um, unless something comes along that says, did you have flood insurance? I mean, would you at least get the ICT money? He had some, and, and we didn't use the ICT money. We basically had a lot of help from being a vet, so a lot of people came in and, and just helped us. And everybody in your situation, I would tell you to make an appointment, come in and actually consult with your floodplain manager. Okay. In your case, that's me. Um, but we'll, we'll see if we have a flood elevation certificate in our file for the dwelling. How far, and how much wood do you have in your house? Uh, two foot. So the, your house is probably around elevation five, your floor. If you get flood insurance, you have flood insurance now? Yes. Can I ask about what you pay a year? Thousand dollars. Okay, perfect. Um, you you want to come in and talk about your options and your availability. I, I'm really feeling for you because I'm. we don't even have a map, and we know we're getting another preliminary map, and they're telling us we're going to force people to raise their houses to an elevation on a map, that we know it's going to change, right? That's so, a great. That's a great. Did you? Did you? Can you just ex, can, that last sentence? Can you just ex, elaborate on that for a second? Right. So we have um, a flood insurance rate map is from 2000, which is, and your your floor is probably right where it's supposed to be. So you pay about a thousand dollars a year. If you're lifting, I am required to make you lift lift to the preliminary flood insurance rate map plus one foot. Which is probably in your case to elevation eight or nine. I think it's been. Um, it's a preliminary map 
that was just thrown out in appeal, but I'm still required to enforce it <laughs> until the new map comes out in 2019 or 2020. Now, I won't even see that map till 2020, and I have to make you, and, and I'm gonna- And you can't get a permit on this house after 2018 is what you were saying. So they want us to lift to it. That's not wait, wait. Thing, she, and not, not be able to get the permit. Out. Wait, let her finish. What is, so if there's, there's two scenarios there. I could have you lift to elevation nine, and you, you it may be wrong. What if the new map says you're at 10? Or what if the new map says you didn't have to lift at all? I mean, really, I, I'm, I'm stuck. Wait, it gets better. You're stuck. When the dune system is done, FEMA has to come in and take into account a 25 foot dune going out 100 feet that's going to protect this, right? Yeah. Dr. Stu Farrell said, if we had this, this dune system has been funded for like eight or 10 years before Sandy, okay? And Dr. Stu Farrell, the leading floodologist, I don't know about that, I see you guys. Um, the leading floodologist said, if we had this dune system, there would have been minimal, Sandy would not have flooded us, the current BFEs would get lowered. Now, I'm not, the, I'm not a FEMA flood map guy. But I'll tell you what I did, what I am doing. I got my map on the FEMA, the FEMA flood people. The people that did the flood map appeal in New York City, everybody from Zerilli down. Zerilli is not the builder out here. Zerilli runs uh, the resiliency program in New York City. From not him, but everybody down there. I've spoken to them. I've spoken to the professor. They got they spent millions of dollars on the flood map appeal. What they did is different than every other map appeal. Correct me if I'm wrong, you hire a consultant to, to, do, to do some of your map appeals? Sure. And you spend fifty to 100000 on a consultant? They spend millions. They went back under the underlying program on the methodology that was wrong, okay? This is, this is supposed to take 100 data points, okay? They took two or three of the worst data points, okay? So it's going to skew the, the BFD higher. I'll show it to you. Like Dan, if you're, if you're a boss, anybody want that information, send me an email. I'll send you that stuff. It's very interesting. My point is, is that your BFE, technically, you're at a six, right? This community is at a six. They're saying you've got to go eight plus one nine. We're, and this is maybe, this is the pre firm maps, right? Yes. And that we, the New York City map appeal is going to affect where you got to go. And we still have to take into account the dune system that's going to protect you. And, it's, and both of those things are probably going to take you down. And you might not have to raise your home. And you and me, who got our elevation grant, probably didn't have to raise our home, and we could give it to somebody who could have raised their home. Pretty stupid, isn't it, of our government doing that? Is that pretty stupid of our government doing that? Our federal government? That's the problem. They need. There is no decision being made. That's the problem. I'm sorry I'm going up on a little tangent, but it frustrates me because many people lost their home. Because of this, and they, and I'm sure you've heard the brunt of it. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Miss Cummings and everyone else here uh, in her position have said, "Why are you making me raise your home?" She's not doing it. What I, what I, what I, it frustrates me because I think people should get maybe 18 months after we have a firm map, a new firm map, to come into compliance. I mean, I, I don't want to make somebody who's in their golden years go through stairs. I really don't. My mom has the same issue. Um, but I think. If we had a firm map and maybe it was 18 months after that, I don't see the harm in it. Especially since the flood insurance rate everybody pays is still based on the 2006 map. I can understand if they were like, no, we need the premium increases because they're not even getting a premium increase until the new map takes effect. So I don't see the benefits of it. I agree. Sir, what, what's your name? Alan Pearson. Mr. Pearson, what, what uh, conflict were you in? Korea. I will help you. I appreciate your service, sir, number one. And I will help you. Email me. I'll take you. I'll walk you through. Me and Alyssa will make sure we will do whatever we can to get you through. I appreciate your service, and we'll get you through, okay, sir? You don't have to worry about nothing. We will take care of it, okay? As much as we can, all right? I appreciate your service. Next question. I just have a quick question since you said about the, about the maps and all of this. And it's not, I didn't want to get on final maps, similar situation to us. You raise it to whatever the number is, and then you come back, and it is hot. It ends up being higher as opposed to what we're anticipating being lower. So people have already raised and have to raise again? No. Yeah. Wow. Well, oh. what, what, well, let me take a step back. <laughs> yeah. We have people, if you go to Stop FEMA Now, if you, I'm sorry, if you go to YouTube backslash Stop FEMA Now, his name is Eddie Duran. And I started this group so I can get this information to, rate, to, 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 to rebuild my home 
four years ago. Eddie Duran works on an oil rig off the Gulf of New, uh, Mexico, okay, in, in Plaquemines Parish. <clears throat> Craziest uh, accent ever heard. And I'm like, why is this guy calling me? And he's like, George, I just want to let you know. This is three, four months after Sandy. I just want to let you know I raised my home after Katrina. I have to raise it again. We have a, name, a young lady in our group. Her name is Laura Futch. She's in Massachusetts. Three times she's raising her home. I'm going to tell you something. Problems. You, you're not going to be required to raise your home if they do the elevation because you're not substantially damaged, but your flood insurance is going to go higher because you're not at that elevation. I only had to raise it two feet. I raised it nine feet because nobody knows where we're going to go. By the way, the, the coastal A zone, can you tell me about the coastal A zone? Yeah. Um, that just happened in last year, right? Yeah, and this isn't a FEMA issue. This is a building code issue. Um, so right now on our maps, this is for the first time, our maps show uh, a line that delineates moderate to wave action. So if you're in a V zone, you're susceptible to waves in at three feet or greater in the event of a storm. The LIMWA is supposed to represent an area where you could see one and a half to two feet in between range. And if you're in that now, New Jersey building code has been changed to require you to build to the V-Zone design standards, which means in our area, where we don't have a solid bedrock, we're up 200 feet of sand or metal mat, piles. Which isn't a big deal. If you're building new, if you're knocking down and building new, I mean, piles is probably more economical at this point. Um, but if you have an existing block foundation, particularly if there's nothing wrong with it, you cannot use it you have to lift your home, take that out, and put in a vertical foundation. Feel it closer, piles. It just came. It's not going to affect me. That rule just came. But if you were dealing with a builder or an architect that knew this, there was a certain date where you could have submitted it. So even if you're raising your home this year, if you submitted, what was the deadline, like August last year, whatever it was, if you, as long as you got the plans approved by August that date. If you had a minute. If you had to, whatever that was. And then you submit your permit. And that's, that's how we're doing it, and that's what we're told. If you submit yeah. your permit application today, we would hold you to the map today. And when you get your flood insurance, as long as you built in compliance with the firm map at the time, and you don't let your policy lapse, we're told your flood insurance will escalate the way I don't, I, see, I don't know. That's the first I've heard. See, I, like that. I, I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer to be honest with, with that. But I would assume if they're making you build in these zone standards and you're not compliant, it would be an issue. But you know, I, I'm like, that's another. That's we'll get to that. One. The, the coastal A is shown on the firm map, but it has no effect on your flood insurance. That's right. That's it doesn't matter point. whether you're in an A or a coastal A. You pay right. the A rate as opposed to the B rate. Right. So that's just it, what I'm saying is it's another change that's coming that. It just came, so it keeps happening. So George, uh, you kind of just answered my question. I was going to ask uh, for new construction, what we need to observe. How is it determined to uh, either drive piles or footings on the foundation? I am in the coastal way, so there's no way around it. I have to drive. Is it piles. new or, or it'll you're raising? Be, it'll be new. I'll have to knock down. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, you would definitely want to drive timber piles. Okay. For I sure. Have one, one other question in regards to that. Would I be able to pour a footing and do structural steel to elevate a new house? No so I have structural steel. So if you want, you can come and look at mine, see what I do with it, and I'll give you a few options, do's and don'ts. But under, yeah, but you raised your house. This yeah. would be totally new construction. Under this coastal way, and it says driven piles, which you just mentioned, would I be able to put a found, pour foundation Footings and a pier. So Structure what you could do is you could put, you could you could take the uh, timbers, drive them in, and then put those supports on top of that. Okay. But you'd still have to have an open foundation system, though. It's the scour requirement. It's almost impossible to meet. Right. I'm sorry. It's it's the scour requirement. Oh, no, right? No. You could can can you put blowout walls there? You, you can put. Um, real walls. So we've, we've got to prove. So Coastal A is real walls? You, can, you can't put block. The bird is on the end here. Kick your foundation. The, the you can design. have walls, but you still have to, like, if they, those walls go away. They blow out walls, right? 
you have still have right. to remain. Yeah. Forward. So you can also basically do a CMU foundation as long as you can hear the design professional can show calculations. What's a CMU? Uh, CMU is a concrete masonry unit. That's okay. It's a, so there's a blowout block wall. It doesn't have to blow out. If the rebar is, is sized appropriately and space tight enough. Look at that. You learn something new every day. But the only thing is, though. But, but yeah, but that's why you got to get guys. I mean, that's new. I, you know. But the cost of doing that is. If you're gonna if you're gonna do it, you might as well just drive timber piles because that's gonna cost. So timber piles are the most cost effective. Okay. Next question. Okay. Thank you. Oh. Other than the ICC clawback on the thirty thousand, what is going on as far as contingency clawbacks? Uh, uh, contingency clawbacks. Yeah, they pretty much um, will take anything that. If you got content, if contingencies in your grant, all right, and they they have a contingency number in there, ten, fifteen, twenty thousand, whatever it is, um, they probably didn't give you fifteen thousand for engineering. I don't know. No. So the way to try to get unclawed back is make sure you take care of all your uh, engineering architectural receipts. That'll go against that contingency. Also, anything the town required but they didn't put in the uh, ECR will go against the contingency. So you may not get a clawback. Because, uh, you know, when they say a clawback, I didn't get the full 150. So I get like 120. Right. Okay, so now all these prices that you got while you're rebuilding, mm -hmm. they've gone up. Oh, oh yeah. Oh. Well, you know, it was all new construction. It was poor damn new construction. Right. I mean, they did a poor job of explaining to people what was going on with what contingency means. They told you, you got a hundred twenty thousand dollar grant. What was your contingency? What they like put forty thousand. Huh. So, so really, you got eighty thousand dollars. Wait. Wait. Rembrandt was sixty eight thousand dollars. It went up to. 200. I mean, you only get up to 150. What, what I'm saying is his original grant award was really 80,000. Right, right. 40,000 dollar contingency. I know, but you, they might have made a mistake. If you can go back you could do a scope and, and, and do a scope change, which is what I did, and I went from 68,000 to 200. I mean, they only give me 150. I wanted to go hot because What's they made the a mistake. Change? What's the scope change? Well, that's why we're here. <laughs> you know? Go ahead. Well, yeah, the scope now. adjustment, you got to take your uh, your file your plans and your whole thing and then basically what you do is you take a look at it and you assess what they did and what they paid you on to what you really have to do the difference of that would be your scope adjustment here, 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 let, I'm, I'm gonna put it in our terms you know it's very simple Ren gave you an estimate to do your home they made a mistake he's gonna look at it and say this is what it really costs you're gonna give it to and they're gonna go, oh, you know, it's 200, I tripled it. I tripled it, they made a mistake. They didn't even know I needed helicopter. Thank God I knew. Imagine if I raised my own with $68,000 grant, I signed it with the contractor, like he said, and then you're gonna need helicopters. Where do I go? So, you know, you wanna sit down with someone who knows rent. That is where you're treading water. So like you say, you really have an $80,000 grant. I, I don't know any home. How many square feet is your home? Was it or is it now? Was it? It was 1,500 square feet. What is it now? 3,600. Wait, you had 1,500 square feet and they only give you 80,000? Yeah. I mean, I'm, assume, wait, I'm assuming you're, you're, you're built. Is that correct? Yeah. Did you, your contractor should explain that to you earlier. I mean, he should have said. No, I, I was the contractor. All right, so you GC'd it. Okay, good. Okay, so, so I had the ability to go out and borrow money for whatever I needed to finish. Okay, so. So, so to build the 1,500 square feet or to rebuild it, you, you chose to build new, which is fine. To rebuild 1,500 square feet, it costs more than $80,000 and raise it, right? Right. So you should have put a scope of work and change. Or originally, you would easily got, my first floor that got flooded was 12, 1,300 square feet, and I got to the 150. Yeah, they did. Okay. They, they, they so the should have done this, should have done that. When you're out of your house for two or three years. Oh, I look, I, look, please. I, I'm, 
No, you might be. I don't know. This is the first time I've heard someone. You got to look at your exhibit one and see what their total development cost of the job was from day one. That's start there. Well, they went with whatever a four bedroom house was. You know, they had those numbers out there for, you know, what it cost. So then they built a three bedroom or a four bedroom. And then they worked from that. Okay, then they deducted if if they didn't get any flood insurance money or they deducted oh. anything else you get from that. That's where they give you your grant award. Right. Oh, they ducked you. You probably got a good award then for the trip. It wasn't 250. <laughs> okay. You know, I have a classic case. Yeah. What he, he has right now. Yeah. They're looking for 40,000. I got a grant of 100. And I already built a house that they told me I was not qualified. They moved. They got in touch with me and told me now that they went over the years and went in. They never explained to anyone because I asked other people there that day. I am also a realtor, so I really was up on my stuff when I yeah. was in there. They never explained that 15%. Right. That now they never do. Now, to no one that I ever spoke well, to. Well, he, to my let me just interject. I cannot stress strongly enough to join the group. Here's pro number one. Your your issue, sir, is unique, and there's going to be others that are going to have that issue. Well, here's what I'm saying though: is we're gonna we're gonna work on getting an answer, good, bad, or ugly. We're gonna get you an answer, but let's share it with the other 10, 15, 20,000 New Jersey members, right? Okay. So here's my other issue with the clawbacks. I know other people. Had no water in their house, crawl space. Got a hundred fifty thousand dollar grant plus red money to raise their house, and now they want to claw back from me. I got hundred twenty total. You know for what? I, can I so, I? so this whole this whole process of oh it used to be seventy five thousand to raise the house. Since the grant money to raise houses one one. I can't tell you how many builders actually came in, probably almost happy about how they coached people into making sure they spent all the 150 that yeah, they spent. Yeah, exactly. So, I, so now they're going to claw back minutes. from those of us that rebuilt. Well, I, I'll, I'll tell you, if we, we can get information, we have other people and... Um, we do. I Jim, I want yeah, he's the key. This whole claw back, back thing is... This can be explained. Do, but nobody but knows yeah. about it. It's, and it's, it's, you know, he's no guy. I need it. I'd have to see his exhibit one. Well, what I would do is I would try and pick Jerry's brain. That's all. That's the only. I mean, Jerry's a nice guy because he knows it better than I am. But basically, you need to change that scope of work that you had but to I try and get more. I think you have. It, I did see, change the scope of work. Wait, wait he, here's the issue. And Has anybody had a? But, but you're, everybody's E one's unique, and you have to you have to examine the E one to answer your questions. <laughs> right, and you have to do it from here to there. I can't answer them. I have a question. Who, who, anybody been, been defrauded by a contractor? Okay. So here, here, here's here, here's where I'm going to come back to you. Are you a, a, a plaintiff on the? A, a, okay. So are you a plaintiff? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. So if you're a plaintiff on the motion for whatever they're doing there, you have a high probability of getting reimbursed. Okay. So you have not only do you have Flood insurance, RAM, house raising, a contractor. Now you also have this fraud. Thing. This is where I'm coming to you, and you finish it right now. Rent will not reimburse you, so you can't finish your house if you want to get reimbursed. You know that, right? Okay. I don't know if that's happening to you. If you, if you've already finished your home, can you go back and now change the scope of work? I don't know if that can happen. If you can, you're in great shape. If you can't, then you're stuck like these folks. See what I'm saying? So I would get the paperwork, and, and if Jerry wants to give me a few minutes of his time, that'd be great, and he could explain it, you know. But I, I don't know. I bring it to the experts, and they kind of figure it out from there. You know what I mean? I don't know the answer. But if you send me an email, uh, what does your what does your project manager say? Your caseworker or your case. I get so many calls from different people all over. You know, I got like ten different people that call. Like, I'll, I'll give you my card, and we'll email, and let's. Like how many from just so you know, just so you know, the REM program, the contract for the REM program is not a contract for X amount of recipients. I'm, I'm going to explain to you. I'm going to explain to you the business you want to be when you grow up. 
The rent program is a time and materials contract. That means every time they pick up the phone, they fill the program. They were originally funding for 15,000 rent recipients. Got approved. There's 8,000. Why are they not bringing in new people? There's a lot of people need help. So every time they pick up the phone, they bill you. Wait, just wait till we find out what it costs to oversee a hundred fifty thousand dollar grant. Just wait till that day comes. When you say they, Joe Bain and Joe Bain is he got it. And they're the ones who actually explain everything to you yeah. go through the process. Yeah. Okay. Explain everything. You go over to Lakewood and they said, "Here's your grant. Yeah. Here's how you cal we calculated it. Here's your money. Goodbye." Here, from from I didn't get the grant and. From my bird's eye view of what I see happening people in town, to me it seems like a good program. Because I know without the REM program, you get stuck with your ICC money, and maybe if you're lucky, you get some HMGP money. So, was they seem to take everybody from the state said, take all these people that were paying unemployment, they would hire them and give them jobs. Exactly. That's what happened. And the nobody had any program, idea yeah. of. Oh no! They just the grant the 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 blew most of the money for oversight, and they didn't yeah. have the right people yeah. overseeing. That's really the bottom line. Yeah. So the birds I hear is dead on. But they, I have to tell you, they did it with me. I went to Hamilton, New Jersey. Ram actually called me on the day of the project uh, managers who sat with me four and five times, and she kept looking. At more and more, and then I had called the attorney that I had gone to, where I sued the insurance company. Um, Did you get more money? I, oh, I got more money on my own. And I don't know who you use later on. Just tell me. <laughs> just let me know. But later. yeah, because for a four-bedroom, three-bath house, four-bedroom, two-and-a-half-bath house, I got seventy-five thousand dollars. Well, you had a four-bedroom, two-and-a-half-bath home. How many square feet? 1,700. 1,700 square feet, and they gave you seventy thousand dollars. How much water did you have? My friend, my insurance. Seventy thousand. Your flood insurance. And how many feet of water did you have in your home? They settled it too. So two two feet of water. Money. Two feet of water. It's, it's disgusting that our, our flood insurance. Our flood insurance program, by the way, is getting reauthorized this September, and I expect everybody to pick up the phone and call their congressmen and senators because I'll be in D.C. and say the flood insurance program is not really an insurance program. It doesn't pay when your home is substantially damaged. Substantially damaged means substantial award. Half of us wouldn't need a, a rent grant if we got our policy limits. Is that correct? Yes. Correct. That's our problem. So please, even with the rent grant, call your congressmen and senators. I am in contact with them all the time, and it helps when more people call and say, this is our problem. But, um, le le so. So they will look, they will look. And, and change your scope after you're done. Change your scope. And then they came back to me, and they wanted um, a new proof of loss. Yeah. And I said no, because I knew that I had sued, and I was, it was, it was said by the state that it would not be duplications of funds if you went and got what you really were supposed to have. And I guess because in my mind, I really think they're so, I know that they're so screwed up. I said, I'm not giving it to you. I'm done. And I had already had my inspection. Now, not for I have not heard from them. It wasn't until I said, don't call me anymore. So, so, so <laughs> who, who got more money from flood insurance on their claim? Anybody reopen up their claim? Okay. That, that, I'll show you an article because everything changes. I don't just say something. I give it to you with a credible source. I try and bring somebody who knows a little bit more than me. Um, but uh, there's an article in the Star Ledger, uh, Senator Menendez, that anything you get from flood insurance will not, and this is a rent program too, same via the tone, will not be a duplication of benefits. I can show you the news article. If you're in our group, just say, hey, George, here it is, and you can look at it. You can research a lot of stuff in that in that group. Okay, so thank you, thank you very much. Next question. Uh, it's it's about uh, unmet needs. I, I'm not sure. Like we were awarded the 150 thousand grant. Uh, our insurance company paid us basically 40 dollars a square foot for our home that was ruined with two foot or uh, what are we? We have two foot of water, just this left. Uh, Told to we were to rebuild. Okay. And 
we were a house when this all happened. Anyway, um, are there any avenues or places? Did, we did could you get a run grant? Did you get a grant from run? The one fifty. Okay, so they and they calculated out one fifty minus whatever you got from uh, your flood insurance. They did they, not. They they gave you the whole one fifty. Well, we've been awarded it. We haven't. The only thing we've used is like that, that fifteen thousand for the yeah. engineering. And yeah, it's different. Work. Different thing. Uh, we were awarded like anything from insurance. Okay. How many square feet, Joe? Like uh, like nine hundred square feet. Nine hundred square feet. How much water did you have? I'm sorry. Two feet. Two feet, and you got thirty six thousand dollars. Yeah. NFIP. That was a joke. You That's spoke. Them, you spoke to my wife Nancy about it. We contacted somebody you knew. Anyway, back January. How much did you get? So we got another seven grand. And they closed our they closed our case because of that. And but Jerry, do you have any? I can't NFIP. It, 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 they we, you almost have to separate them when you're talking about rent. Yeah, yeah. NFIP ripped everybody off pretty much. For yeah. sure, yeah. You know, especially you hear something like that. That's incredible. Yeah. But really, what happens is when REM gives you that grant, they do something called a total development cost. Really, it means what was assuming your house was completely destroyed. To what's it going to cost the day after the storm to put you back? All right, that's called a total development cost, and they start deducting from there. And when they start deducting, they they start deducting any money you got from uh, what flood what insurance, right. donation, um, uh, my, my ICC, not ICC yeah. yet, but uh, if you t originally when you took the loan, SBA, uh, SBA, SBA loan. Okay. So they would take that. Let's say that your total development cost the day after the storm was two hundred thousand, and you got zero from SBA and from flood. You got 165,000. They can give you 150 of it. You understand? So you got 150. Right. The 15, they threw that in later. So just forget that. Okay. But you got it. So good. So the bottom line is that's how they did that. But if NFIP gave you 200,000 and your total development cost was 200, REM would have gave you zero. You understand? Okay. That's how they did it. So. Um, as far as you getting any money, you would have to have an unmet need to use your ICC. In your case, you might. You might have one like maybe twelve, fifteen thousand. So, so if you get thirty, you, you can get fifteen. 15 of it. Is that duplication of services? Now? Not the no, first fifteen. I'm just doing a math in my He's head. He's just real doing quick. basic math. Right, right. You know, but you know, there, there could be changes to scope that'll get you up higher. Correct. This is where I'm getting at. Okay, that's your right. project. People right. are looking, people are going to a contractor and old. saying, how much is to raise my home? And you get a guy to do it for X. But what if we can get you more money and get you to use your credit? That's the issue. Even if you maxed out your grant, your unmet need could go higher so you can get other things that won't get clawed back from the grant. That's, well, we, that's, we've interviewed a couple, I'm sorry to cut you off, a couple builders early on right. and asked, how much is your how much is your project? Or like, what are you going to right, spend right, on? Right. And my wife and I had no idea. Like, it's I have no idea what a house costs mm -hmm. because it seems it all you know you see one sixty nine or whatever you're seeing you know sure sure turnkey and uh, I don't know Wait, there's, there's, there's a lot of, a lot of uncertainty we are get sorry. somebody get you speak this rent. Do we understand that yeah. if you're in the rent program, speak, yeah. there's a lot of variables, especially for the folks that have been in it and done it. If you've been in and done it now, would you have? Would this meeting have helped two years ago? Yeah. Oh yeah. Sure. You know, and again, look, you know, and we've had these meetings, but you know, they're they're sparse, and we, you know, I wish I had these this meetings for me when I started because I had some issues that I cost me a lot of money. Um, so if you're in the REM program, get somebody who speaks REM. Don't get a builder with a bag on. A truck. I mean, and you got a lot of people in our group, and it's disgusting. Next, uh, next question. Question: uh, Who administers the rent program? Is that DCA? Who applies to DCA? Wait, wait. It's the Department it's of. Not, it's uh, wait. It's Department of Community Affairs. 
you had the, you had fraud, right? Right. It's Department of Consumer Affairs. Right. They're different, right? Exactly. Okay, all right. Yeah. Clarify that. Yeah. yeah, no, everybody thinks it's the same. It's not. Exactly. So, HUD advises when? Stafford Act. Everything's, everything goes on to the Stafford Act. HUD's funding. Well, HUD is where they get the funding so, from. After a disaster, we get a lot of federal money. I think normally I would get that in 406 or 404 money, and those are programs the federal government administers so I can like elevate roads and put in check valves and do mitigation projects. Because okay. right now they'll pay me to fix what was broken, but I can't improve it. All the money that we would have gotten in those programs, New Jersey DCA through HUD sent to the RREM program. Because the federal government can't give you money other than that. Um, so it's, I call it federal money laundering, the state's laundering the grant to allow to pass the Jersey, which is fine. It's getting to you one way or the other. <laughs> it's housing and urban development. Yep. I just want to share our story. Um, kind of like we're saying, you know, you think you're the only one, and then when you're part of the stock payment, how could we find out? As crazy as your story is, there's other people who are in the same the same situation. I don't really know if I have a question other than I want to share it to see if anybody just has any options or could think out of the box for us. But I think the answer is we're going to have to tear down our house and sell it for the land and walk away. But this is what happened. We're secondary homeowner. We are not in brick. Let me tell you, I wish we were because Tom's River Township does not have near the knowledge or the care for the compassion that Brick seems to show. So let me just say that to you. Um, Tom's River Township, Ocean Beach, traditional bungalow. It's the original bungalow, 1940s. We bought it from the original owners 20 plus years ago. So, you know, it's a little it's a size house. Ocean Block. Nobody knew what the hell we were doing back then, right? It was nobody knew what to do. We we built. No more. We don't have a mortgage. We don't have flood insurance. We're, we're on our own. Thanks to family, friends, our own savings. We sit back together. Well, happy. We're back in it a year later, September of 2013. We're in. Had our first rental season, summer of 2014. A year later, you're substantially damaged. You have to raise your house. We find out a year after we're back in. I got our CEO, had our, we did everything. We had a local contractor, it was wonderful, beautiful. I have been through everything. George knows I have rallied, I have written, I was in one of the newspapers, I was interviewed for, I mean, I have done everything. I did the appeal. I said, I want to have a reassessment done. When they first did it, they were like, no, definitely appeal. I said, this doesn't make sense. How could we be substantially damaged? Is it improvements don't count? You're right. Carve out your expenses. Just show what you used to literally piece back the house, which was like twenty something thousand. That wasn't a lot. Twenty thirty something. Thousand. They're like, oh no, your appeal is denied because you did improvements. You know what my improvements were? I put in new windows. So that's that they considered. Was an approved. So I made it. I mean, so like, I called. Yeah, that's pretty. And this is my favorite like quote. Approved, so I want to share with all of you, our government officials. I want to share. I called my friend, the ombudsman at Tom's River, and said, "Mr. So and So, when we had this conversation, you told me to appeal. You said yes. I said not to include your improvements because improvements would not be considered as part of the substantially damage claim. Now you're telling me, oh no, it is." Well, we're very sorry. I misspoke. I told you wrong. Yes, it's counted. And I said, well, you know, Mr. Ombudsman, anybody who's gutting their house and is rebuilding their house, the majority of people are going to make some improvements. Like, put in new windows in a house that's how many years old? You don't and like he you said, if you're <laughs> trying to apply logic to this situation, you're in the wrong business. That's their answer. There you go. Now, now I'm stuck. Now we're stuck. Um, so I think at time to sell, we're going to have to tear down the house and sell just for the land. What about the bungalows? What, I'm sorry. What about the bungalows on the brick side? Two feet of water. Are they are they done? They're not done. Is there is there room to wiggle? Well, so we have a, we have abandoned properties. We have we no yeah we have a lot of. Bungalows that I, I got, my first estimate was you had eighty thousand dollars in damage. You're invested fifty. Like there's no way I can help you at that point. 
Um, but we had some people that actually came back and they had receipts. And if you had receipts, you did a lot of the work yourself. Depending on the trade, I apply a multiplier to it. Um, and I come up with a number. And I, I do appreciate it when those people kind of put that together for me. I don't really come in with a shoebox <laughs> full of like thousands of receipts. Um, took a while. But I, I would, like, I, and it's very subjective because every flight plane manager is going to look at it differently. I don't look at things that you have to do for routine maintenance, like a window, um, a new roof. Like those are things you have to do to your house every, you know, 30 years. They counted everything. They counted everything. When I'm telling you we're, we're, we're this close, I tell you it's close. This much over that 50 results we came. Why don't we do? You and I will have a chat offline. We'll figure this out. I don't think you're. I I, I wish I would have known you were this close because when you're this close. We can limbo, um, you know, we can limbo a little bit. Yeah, yeah. The substantially damaged, you guys have used two words. One is fair value, and the other is assessed value. Now, the houses on the barrier island, in work at least, the assessed values are artificially low because of the value of the land. Fair value is a different number. When I had mine being substantially damaged, the basis was the assessed value, which was $40,000. Is what, and because you know, to fix the bungalow is clearly more than twenty thousand dollars, so it's assessed value. Or is it fair market value? So, you're again, not everybody's going to have an appraisal for their property or their house, especially a recent one available for me to use because you're waiting on a catastrophic event. So, I'm allowed to take the assessed value of the structure. And apply what's called an equalization ratio to it. It's established by the tax assessor and it is throughout the township. So bricks is different than Palms River, it's different than Point Butter Island. And what that does is supposed to give you a fair market value adjustment based on how far we are away from when you were assessed. But that equalization ratio, you're only applying to the assessed value of the structure. Not the whole property. And if I feel only cares about your structure. Would I be able to get an appraiser doing an appraisal for right before the storm on my property and give it to you? Not if you cut it the house. No, no, before the storm. Oh, yeah. If, so, you, cut it, if you had a recent appraisal for whatever reason, I can use that. Okay. Which very few people have. Wait, wait, a recent one before the yeah, but can I today, can I call my appraiser and say, just go back to the data on October 20, 20th of 2012, and what was my property worth that day? The data is there. A lot of them won't separate the structure from the land. What, or, if, I, what if I can do that? What I don't know that you can because I'm going to look at your assessment. Yeah. I, I just got to be consistent. All right, I understand. So I would take your appraisal and I'm going to treat you the same way I would treat everybody yeah, else. Yeah. If your appraiser said your property was worth more. But then we, did do that. we did the reappraisal. I went to an appraiser to try it. And again, it all comes down to okay. those stupid freaking windows. They told me this. Four and a half years ago. See, I don't. We're also we're also only going Thank back you. five years. Thank you. So I, me, okay. Well, let's say for whatever reason, let's say anybody's in this situation, you're substantially damaged. You did not raise your house for whatever it's my situation or whatever situation. You were like we're saying in the very beginning. You go to sell. That buyer, obviously, you have to disclose to that buyer you're substantially damaged. So, are you generally speaking? Are you just? I mean, that person's going to be facing. They're going to inherit with their mess, which means they're going to either have to raise the house or tear it, it down. It, 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 it's worth. It, it, those bungalows are worth like ten thousand less. Are you better off just worth. ripping it down and selling it and selling it? No, those are the towns. Well, you, you know what I would do? Here's what I would do. Remember, we were talking about the different elevations. I would ride it out until a gun gets put to your head. I don't want to sell any time soon. But you know, the elevation might come back down. I mean, we're talking about just, but I don't know if they're going to start fining us because we didn't rain. Something's going to happen. We don't know. I don't know if anyone in New Orleans that got fined. Okay. And I, I, I could be wrong, but I, don't, I haven't heard anything about that. I agree. will threaten you. Like, if you're not in compliance, you might be well, fined. If you're right. not in compliance, you're not going to give you a CEO. You're not in I mean, that's a condition of your no, we'll, 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 we're telling it if you want to strip it down, we will. But especially on the barrier islands and on the beachfront, 
there's so many other variables. There's capital requirements. There's there could be zoning. You may have a homeowners association. Just the value of an established footprint. Okay. May so to it. Do, do me a favor. Let's take this offline, and I'll give you a hand. I'll walk you through it. Come to yes, sir. Just to this gentleman's point about the appraised value, you can only appeal the total number. So when the tax assessor puts a small number on your house and a big number on your property, it's so when it gets torn down after Sandy, they're still collecting a lot of taxes, taxes <laughs> on the value of the land, and you can't get them to change the balance between the land and the house. This is how it's been gained. So when you limit the structure and they say, okay, that structure for $60,000. No, it's, it's, and it's you can't you're stuck. You can't appeal the split between the land and the house. It's a game. That's a good point, sir. Any other questions that we have? Yes, sir. Just one last one. We came in late. I apologize. I missed okay. Frank's introduction, but my question concerns uh, advocates. Um, if an advocate turns you on to a contractor and it turned out to be fraud, are there any legal maneuvers there that, you, that, that are out there? Well, I would publicly call them out. I mean, you know, like to me, look, I, I, I take it very personal if I recommend somebody uh, or our group recommends somebody. We, we don't do that willy-nilly. Um, uh, if, if somebody does that, you want them to stop and not, not hurt other people like you've been hurt. So, uh, you know, me, I kind of put it out there on a megaphone and, you know, just put it out there, you're a bad guy and you shouldn't be recommending people. But there's no problem, you, you guys are in the front lines and ladies are Well, is, is it like a, like a recovery group or is it like a, like a church? I don't know, I, you know, I don't know what your question is. No, it's, it, it, it was a group of two or three people. Why don't you talk to me all the time and we'll talk. I got it? Um, not directly. Not direct. In some instances, like my parents' program grant, they, they had a contractor circle by the program manager on who to use. I can't tell you who to use, but this one's good, and they circled it, and it turned out that they were a, a, they're accused of fraud. So in some cases, even the, even the program was um, recommending contractors that were. It's crazy. It's crazy. But anyway, look, um, thank you very, very much. If you have any questions, look, stop FEMA now. And please thank, uh, I'm going to go again. It's um, Frank, Jerry, Alyssa, Jeff, and Matt. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Anything, feel free to chat. Yeah, any come questions, up. We'll, be, we'll be hanging around. Yeah. Everybody wants to sit and chat about their particular problems. So we'll try to help thank you that way also. Yeah, thirty nice.